good evening and welcome back to the Journey Home program. I'm your host, John Mark Grodi, here on EWTN. And once again, we have this great privilege to come together uh, to share a story, to hear about how the gospel has taken root in a particular person's life and transformed them. And we're great to have the great opportunity to, to be witness to that, to hear that today. We're joined by Dr. Catherine Ware. She's a former Baptist and Anglican. We're going to hear all about, you know, what's behind that that uh, that subtitle later. Mm -hmm. But uh, thanks for being here, Katie. Yes, it's a pleasure. It's great to finally uh, meet you and talk to you. And we've been trying to get you on the show for a while, so it's glad to finally happen. Yeah. So, and we're going to get to it later. But you're you're the editor of a new annotated edition of The Man Born to Be King by Dorothy right. L. Sailors. Yes. I can't wait to hear more about that. Mm -hmm. You're the, also the managing editor of Logos, a journal of Catholic thought and culture. Right. And your website is katherineware.com. And we'll have that mm -hmm. up on the screen so people can type it in properly. But we're uh, so excited to be talking to you tonight. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Pleasure to share my story. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's, let's go back to the beginning. Where were you brought up? What's your, what's your faith background? Sure. So I'm I'm from Minnesota, and um, I grew up in a I mean a wonderful family. I have so much to be grateful for. Yeah. Um, a very faithful Christian family. Um, was raised in a, a Baptist church that eventually dropped the Baptist name, so right. kind of broadly evangelical. But um, yeah, I I mean wh whenever there was anything going on at church, we were there. You know, Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday nights, and um, I think one of the best gifts was just the the strong sense that church is where I belonged, there with God's people, that Christ was the center of our life and the center of our home. I feel like my parents were wonderful models of that. You know, I always would come in in the morning, in on my mother who was reading her Bible or praying. Um, my father, you know, we'd, we'd pray after meals sometimes. And, and my father actually ran a... Um, a ministry called Al's Pals, which was a kind of youth group for, for high school guys, a high <laughs> nice. school ministry. Um, so that was always just a part. Both my, my, my mother was very involved in things at church, like Awana. I was involved in the Awana program. What does that stand is, for, Awana? It stands for Approved Workmen Are Not Ashamed. Okay. Um, it's basically a scripture memory club. Ah, cool. So that's what we did on Wednesday nights. Uh, so what a gift, right, yeah. to yeah. have all, this, this, uh, all these pieces of God's Word hidden in our hearts. Um, my mother would even, um, uh, if we needed money to go on a youth group thing or something, she'd be like, okay, well, $10, that's 10 verses. So we'd have to memorize 10 <laughs> verses and then she'd pay us the $10. Yeah. Um, so a good, a good way to maybe bribe us, but, but to actually help that become part of, Absolutely. of who we, who we were as kids. So two older siblings, I was the youngest, um, and, but I was kind of a little more uh, sensitive. I think I was very aware of my older siblings. I wanted to belong. I was very aware of, of um, you know, what they were doing. And I think that overflowed into my spiritual life as well, that I often felt like, what, you know, what's happening around me? And am I doing the right things? Am I feeling the right things? Um, and that that's a theme that, sure. that kind of carried through. Um, but I would say one of the real gifts that I think of from the earliest part of my life was, was actually, um, my church had a big missions festival every year in October, I think, um, would be a missions festival and there'd be missionaries that our church supported that would come from all over the world and would speak. There was just a sense that God was active in the world and that we could be a part of it. And I love that. I felt like I wanted to be a missionary because I wanted to be a part of what God was doing in the world. And so that's what I said for many years, that I, I wanted to be a missionary, because that was sort of the one word in my vocabulary to express being a part of God's work in the world. Yeah. Um, so that's... Um, and that's so important. Again, that sense that, that sure. God's active. Sometimes mm -hmm. we can have kind of a general, very intellectual idea of the faith, but this, this part of the kerygma, you know, right, is, you know, that the gospel remains active. Yeah. God is active. He's doing things, and I need to be find my place in that mm -hmm. ongoing work. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. You know, and it was exciting. These missionaries would come, and it was, you know, you think of the, the early 80s, you know, it was like all about the flag ceremony <laughs> and stuff. There was all these flags from all over the world yeah. hanging all over the church and yeah. booths where missionaries would, would share their ministry, and they'd come to all our Sunday school classes. Um, and so, you know, of course, there were stories about like strange foods or, you know, national dress or whatever, but it was very exciting because it was all connected to faith mm -hmm. that like 
God was not just the God of our church or our country, but God was active all over the world, moving in people's hearts, calling him to himself. Right. And so I, I wanted to be a part of that. That's beautiful. Yeah. We're joined tonight by Dr. Catherine Ware, former Baptist and Anglican. All right, so you have a wonderful, a wonderful roots there, wonderful seeds planted yeah. in your childhood. That's beautiful. Uh-huh. Yeah. So I, I would uh, say, so if I think of kind of the next mm -hmm. chunk, I was baptized when I was 16, and that was a real just kind of act of faith. I, it was funny because I was a Baptist church, but not many of the people in my youth group were baptized, uh, which sometimes happens uh, because it becomes something that is important for church membership. So sometimes people would just wait until they actually want to become a member of a church, then they get baptized. Um, but I felt like it was something that the Bible clearly said that Christians should do. So I asked to be baptized right. at 16. And, um, but I, it was funny because it, this woman who prepared us, who helped us get into these white robes and, and be ready. Of course, this is a big, you know, like a big jacuzzi in the, in the church, basically. <laughs> um, but to prepare for that. And she just said like, oh, the Lord will meet you in, in a really special way today. Um, but as I mentioned, I was kind of a, a sensitive child and really wanting to do things the right way um, that, uh, you know, like I remember being baptized and, and coming up and feeling like, I don't feel different. I must have done something wrong. You know, I had been one of those little kids that asked Jesus into my heart many times because I really wanted it. I wanted to do it right. Um, and so just, I mean, we could say later when I came to understand a sacramental understanding of baptism, that really helped heal that moment because I could look back and say, wow, it really wasn't about what I was doing. It was about what God was doing right. um, through there. And, and of course, rejoicing at, at my faith, my act of faith, saying that I wanted to be baptized, that I wanted to follow Jesus, um, but, uh, but it wasn't dependent on my feelings um, or, you know, doing it right. Yeah. Um, it's funny about how, you know, how our, uh, our, exp that kind of ex experiential, you know, uh, mm -hmm. internal dialogue, it bumps up against our theology real fast. Cause the yeah. question of, yeah, what, what actually is going on in baptism? What does the sacrament uh -huh. mean? What, yeah, you know, even before, long before we articulate those or, or understand the theology or ask those, mm -hmm. you know, fully articulated questions, we, we begin to bump up into the practical realities. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I think that that was kind of a theme, and I, I, you know, I was I was kind of a deep thinker as well. So, just there, there began to be more of a, I began to notice more of those things. You know, a wonderful church, wonderful youth group, fun things. But I often felt like I don't know if I'm feeling what everybody else is feeling around me, and that troubled me. Um, and but I really wanted to please God, and. Um, and so there was, there was an earnestness there, but I was never sure I was quite um, good enough, <laughs> in mm -hmm. a sense. So um, when I, the summer, oh, I wanted, it's one thing I wanted to say, because sure. this is really important before we get to, to college. Um, there's just this other, one other little stream of, of, of beauty, really, because I, I was very creative and I very musical. I loved, I loved singing. And, and my school system had a really wonderful choral program who I later realized the head of the high school program was actually the director of the Twin Cities Catholic Chorale, which is why he had to sing wonderful music. <laughs> um, but uh, he also had a, a chamber choir. And so they did a lot of, ended up being a lot of sacred music. But when I was in junior high, a friend of mine gave me an album of the, the Cambridge Singers. It was the album called Brother, Son, Sister, Moon, where they had, um, it was kind of a morning side of the CD, mm -hmm. or a, well, really, of the tape. Um, <laughs> the morning side of the tape and then an evening. So the morning side had, had all of these, uh, what I now recognize as like the Easter um, sequence and other, you know, Palestrina, all these things that I had never experienced before. And the, the, the evening side had all of this music for Compline. So I got to know some of these things, and it, it really opened up a whole different side of my imagination, really. Right. Um, I had loved that sense of God working in the world, but I really began to ask questions about, like, how did people throughout time worship God? And this music was so beautiful. There's something about it that really 
called to me. Right. And, um, and so I began to think about well, people who lived in other time periods. And I've heard that, you know, not everyone used to have a Bible. How did people have a relationship with God if they didn't have their own Bible at home? And so I began to think more about, about prayer and worship. And then um, later, you know, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that later, but of, of discovering liturgy and that kind of, kind of thing right. was a bigger, in the sacraments, of course, right. a bigger part of that answer. But this was the start of those questions. Sure. And, and not only, so not only across the world, but throughout time, yeah. these are the, the questions that were really forming in my mind. What would your worship experience have looked like up to this point? in terms of a, of a Sunday service. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think up up and up until this point, it was still pretty traditional evangelical. I mean, there really wasn't the praise and worship movement going on yet. Right. So I think of, of hymns, you know, wonderful hymns. I think especially set Sunday evening when we come back was like a longer sermon, but there'd be lots of, of hymns. Um, and so I loved, yeah, I, I love that too. In youth group, of course, we had we had more of the kind of, of praise and worship yeah. things going on at that at that time too. Um, but, you know, long half hour sermons, uh, long uh, series mm. that we went through different books of the Bible. Sunday nights were, were um, things more maybe to draw people in, like a series on the book of Revelation that yeah. frightened us all to death. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but that, that kind of thing. Sure. And I remember the pastor saying um, one time, uh, you know, you know, it, the scripture says it's not for us to, to know the, the, the times and dates, but if my calculations are correct, <laughs> right, Jesus is right. going to come back in 1998, yeah. which I knew, you know, this is in the 80s, but I thought that's the year I'm going to graduate from college. Yeah. Um, oh, what, how should I, how should I then be living um, if, if, um, you know, if that's when Christ will come back? Yeah. So, um, you know, lots of, I don't know. Lots of big questions going sure, on sure. in my mind, um, but a, really a lot to be to be grateful for. Absolutely, yeah. And then, as you said, there's a, a thread that you'll ex keep exploring later. Mm -hmm. This attraction to beauty, this this yes. sense of uh, beautiful hymns, some of these, some of this uh, Christian tradition that was, uh, you know, that you were discovering mm -hmm. through the music that you know it wasn't really part of your experience, but you're seeing kind of a broader yeah. you know, picture. And the question of what does that look like throughout history? Yeah. yeah. Interesting. All right. So what, so, what happens next? Yeah. Well, I would say the next chapter really starts with these big summer long mission trips that I went on before and after my senior year of high school um, with Royal Servants, which uh, had a lot of different youth groups. Uh, I mean, groups of youth that were going to different parts of mostly Europe. But I, um, in 93, went on the Russia team and, and then the next year went on a, 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 a team called World. And so... Um, so the Russian one was just after, you know, the the wall came down. So we right. did Bible distribution, okay, um, and that was amazing. Yeah, and to be able to walk into these, we would just take a bus and go to the little villages, and all I really knew how to say was like, "This is a Bible. It's a gift." Wow. <laughs> et a biblia, et a badarik. and I was like, "That that was basically it." But we just gave Bibles away, and people still didn't have them at that point. And so wow. that felt like a real, yeah. you know, obviously we were Bible Christians. It, they needed to have Bibles. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but most people knew what they were, but they didn't have one. So that it felt like a, a yeah. real um, amazing kind of ministry. Right. Yeah. Um, and then the next year with World, we went to Israel, Egypt, India, Thailand, Hong Kong, China, and the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And I would say that trip you know, I mean, it certainly connects to my childhood of like wanting to be a missionary and wanting to be a part of what God was doing in the world. This trip was specifically for people, uh, for young people, you know, who to give us exp exposure to people working in different countries and what kind of ministry they did. We also looked at, like we did little mini studies of, of Judaism, of Islam, of Hinduism, of Buddhism. Um, and so it was really kind of mind blowing but also doing a lot of hands-on ministry that took me a while to, to work through, really, mm -hmm. um, and was actually a big part of kind of the catalyst of a lot of other bigger questions. Because, you know, in, in India, working with street children or just seeing, seeing people begging on the street who had, for instance, purposely maimed their own children so that they could beg better. Mm -hmm. And so asking those big questions like, why does God allow this kind of thing? I didn't even think it existed. 
or um, working, volunteering in an orphanage in, in China where if there are children that had severe medical things, they just didn't feed them because they didn't know how to help them or they didn't have the resources. Yeah. So this kind of thing that was so shocking that I didn't know existed in the world and I felt like I grew up in a comfortable suburb and I, you know, I had sort of imagined because of some verses in the Bible that, that poverty is sort of ennobling, um, but it really, um, it, it is ennobled through relationship with Christ, right. you know, like not in and of itself, it is something that is grinding and ugly. And I had sort of wanted to be, I even I, at the time thought like, I want to be like Mother Teresa with open arms, you know, because, yeah. you know, everybody knew Mother Teresa. But I remember feeling like I just want it to go away because right. I don't know how to, I don't know how to fix it. It's another example of, again, the, those practical realities bumping us up against our theological presumptions. You know, yes. this question of the incarnationality of our Christianity. You know, yeah. is, is it merely the spiritually intellectual or does the body matter? You know, right. You know, that, there are all those kind of questions that we, uh -huh. we never thought about before. We never, yeah. Yeah. And I think that, I mean, there was, of course, the, the missions movement was such a, a big thing of, of mm -hmm. taking youth on mission trips. And, you know, it, it, of course, raised questions of, even in my own heart of like, we're here for 10 days. Like there's nothing that we're doing that's fixing a problem. Um, and, or that just the needs are so great. And this, it's really systemic, these problems. It's not something that we're going to fix and I don't know what to do about it. Right, right. Um, and so then, I mean, that then, I came home four days later, started college. So it, it kind of, I really spent the next four years kind of processing, uh, yeah, processing yeah. It and unwinding through that. And because of that, I had these big questions and I felt like the pretty emotional kind of worship that I had grown up with that was very dependent on whether I'm sort of feeling close to God in this, in this moment, um, I just, I couldn't couldn't do it. You know, I, I felt, um, I felt like a fraud and I needed something else. And so that's really what, what kind of brought me to exploring, um, other kinds of, of ways of, of worshiping. So, um, through actually uh, my brother who had become Episcopalian, um, and he had actually interned at a, at an Episcopal church, not far from where I went to college. And so, I started going there and that really opened the doors to all kinds of new things for me. I, um, I often say that, that what, what kind of brought me to Anglicanism eventually brought me to Catholicism because um, the, it's sort of the deeper you go in, the more you think about how is this connected to everything else. Right. But, but I, I just remember just the, the, the palpable sense of like, I can't believe that there are people all over the world that are reading this same scripture today. I had never thought that kind of thing existed. You know, I just right. hadn't considered it. I thought everybody does, you know, whatever their pastor chooses, a, a, bo a book, Bible book series. Um, but no, like millions of people are reading the same gospel today. That is so cool. Or the liturgical calendar. Um, I specifically remember looking around um, you know, the first time I went during the general confession and that everybody's, everybody's admitting things, you know, um, even though we're just saying things like things, you know, done and left undone and these kinds of things that, but I remember thinking, wow, the, the kind of confession I was used to, which we'd only been, I mean, it was only part of the service when we were about to take communion about once a month or I think once a month at our church growing up. Um, you know, but it would be like quiet organ playing and just silence of like, well, you better, um, you know, make sure your heart is right with God. You don't want to take communion um, wrongly. Yeah. Um, and so, but here people were just saying it out, out loud, you know, Lord, forgive us for the wrong things we've done. And I thought, wow, that it seemed kind of like scandalous, you know, <laughs> like, they're saying, I'm right here. They know I can hear them say this. Um, it, so it just really surprised me. Um, and then of course, receiving, um, communion every week, just the, the kind of structure of that, of like, even if I had all of these questions in my mind about how God is working in the world or whether I'm feeling close to God or not, that I can 
join in with the people of God, and then come forward physically to the altar to offer myself to God and to receive communion. And so that was a really important step for me. It was right. very freeing because it wasn't based on whether I'm feeling the right things. Right. So you're encountering this, this liturgy that's, that's uh, impacting you, really opening you up. Did, mm -hmm. What was your sense up to this point in terms of, I mean, did you identify as a Baptist? at this point or did you, yeah, what was your I, sense of like the different groups yeah, yeah i think i mean growing up i went to a public school so there there was a real cross section yeah. of of um christians and and people that weren't particularly religious mm -hmm. there were a few christian um catholics in my in my high school and um but i just remember i don't know the way i grew yeah. up and maybe everybody feels that way like well i don't know if you know <laughs> are they real christians or whatever sure. um but I, I remember one pretty good friend in, in high school, who I remember her saying, like, I think it's harder to be Catholic because our Bible is bigger. And I remember thinking, <laughs> that can't be right. <laughs> because in my youth group, you know, it's the kind of thing we talk about. You know, like, like, these are you know, the structure of the, the books of the Bible. And like Catholics believe in these, you know, have these other books. But I remember knowing that they were mostly history or wisdom books. And I thought, they aren't additional commandments, right, I don't think. <laughs> um, so I don't know what she's talking about. I'm not sure she knows what she's talking about. The Bible about. reading plan is just a, you know, a few days longer. I mean, that's, yeah. that's the... <laughs> <laughs> right. So, yeah. but you know, but yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I guess the, the issue is that I hadn't really met any Catholics that I, I thought had a faith that, that yeah. I kind of recognized. Mm -hmm. And that was a really big part later on. Sure. So, um, so anyway, so now we're firmly yeah. into my 20s. And I would say that scattered through that, there were a few, uh, a few people, a few families that I met that were Catholics. And I remember thinking, um, yeah, and seeing, seeing more that we had in common. Um, I didn't feel like Catholicism had any call on me at that time, but um, I think a lot of Anglicans feel this way of, of like, as Anglicans, we're sort, of, we're sort of in the middle. We can reach everybody. Like, we're the glue that holds the church together, really. <laughs> right. um, and so I remember, like, feeling like, oh, I can appreciate the best things. And even, you know, even sometimes, like, I had one colleague who was a very faithful Catholic, and she would go to daily Mass during lunch. And I, I would go with her sometimes. You know, I wouldn't receive, but I, I just thought it was kind of cool. Like, she seemed really serious about this. Um, and so... I, you know, did that. And sometimes there was a, a parish not far from where I lived that sometimes I would, I would go to daily mass. Again, I knew that I wasn't supposed to receive, but it was just occasionally, because I just, I thought it was kind of amazing that there were people that were so committed that would like get up at 630 to come to daily mass, <laughs> you know, and start their yeah. day that way. Yeah. And I, I just didn't know that kind of thing. I guess in the Anglican world, you know, there's the, this sort of ideal of morning and evening prayer. And Thomas Cramner created yes. this beautiful book of common prayer that has these. But I really didn't know many Anglicans who, who really did that. And there certainly weren't any Anglican churches that I, at least that I was a part of, that, you know, people would go to that. But I felt like, here are Catholics that are actually kind of living the dream of Cranmer, <laughs> you know, like mm -hmm. that they're actually coming together as a community to start their day. Um, and... Uh, you know, even though I could see it was, you know, more older people or whatever, like it was, yeah. um, but it was still a kind of ideal that I felt like I could really admire in right. Catholics. So at this point, were you involved in, you were involved in the Anglican? Right. Yeah. That yep. was, okay. And this mm -hmm. is still in college. Sorry, point. no, we're, okay. we're, we're pretty far That's beyond that, that okay. now. Sorry. Um, but just, uh, you know, but working and I, for a while I was involved in a, um, uh, a young adults group at a Baptist church as well, but eventually I felt like, you know, I just I just love liturgy. Sure. I just that is just the the, the form of worship that really spoke to right. me. Well, let's take, actually take a break there. So okay. we got like, lots of great threads in the water, mm -hmm. you know, lots of great seeds planted, as you said, and we'll kind of hear what happened next, what changed. Okay. You know, uh, when we come back from the break, so great. We're joined tonight by Dr. Catherine Ware, former Baptist and Anglican. And she's the editor of a new annotated edition of The Man Born to be King by Dorothy L. Sayers. She's also the managing editor of Logos, a journal of Catholic thought and culture. And her website is www.catherineware.com. We'll talk more about those, those books and uh, the organization later on. We'll be back in just a couple minutes to hear the rest of Dr. Catherine Ware's story. See you then.
Well, hello and welcome back to the Journey Home program. We're entering the second half of our hour tonight speaking with Dr. Catherine Ware, former Baptist and Anglican. She's the editor of a new annotated edition of The Man Born to be King by Dorothy L. Sayers, and also the managing editor of Logos, a journal of Catholic thought and culture. We're going to get to both of those in a minute. I want to hear more about them, but we want to get back to your story, make sure that we sure. finish it off. Again, great story so far. I'm just remarkable you know all the little threads you know that in your life you know in terms of beauty and liturgy and your you know the beautiful hymns from your childhood your wonderful uh family background in the faith you know so uh at this this point you're involved in the anglican church i am yeah and what, yeah. what, what happens next yeah. yeah so i think um oh i went i went to graduate school i went to uh, regent college in vancouver canada and so that was a christianity and the arts program that's actually where I where I encountered Dorothy L. Sayers the first time, and these particular plays, The Man Born okay. to Be King. Um, I just picked it off a book list. Yeah, and some um, people may not be familiar with with Dorothy Dorothy Sayers. Right. So yeah, so she's a contemporary of C.S. Lewis, right. um, and so a British author, Anglican, um, and so these are a series of plays. She's perhaps best known for her Lord Peter Whimsey mystery novels. Right. So some people get to know her that way. Yeah. I would say that a lot of people today who know of her through her um, uh, an essay called The Lost Tools of Learning, which is very popular with, with classical educators right. and homeschoolers. Um, so some people know her that way. Some people know her because of her work on Dante. Right. So I love her because she's in she's so many different genres, yeah. Yeah. right? Um, that's, that's great. Uh, so I first encountered those there, but also you know did a lot of deep thinking about the arts and theology and bringing those two things together. As a musician myself, I, I did a, um, an album of music as my thesis there, which you can do, so, <laughs> which is kind of cool. Yeah. And, um, but I then returned to the Twin Cities and was working in marketing and that kind of thing. But then I, um, I just felt like I was, a, I was a little stuck. I knew I, I needed some kind of change in my life. And I decided I wanted to figure out a way to live in the UK for a while. So eventually I found um, an opportunity to, to be an intern at a place called the Simeon Center for Prayer and the Spiritual Life, which was at Ridley Hall at the University of Cambridge. And so it, first it was just going to be a, like a, a term, a semester um, in exchange for room and board to volunteer there. I ended up staying two years and doing another master's degree in pastoral theology. Um, but that was a really important point to think deeply about Anglicanism itself. Um, I was, you know, it was a seminary, so with all these men and women who were moving toward ordination, and the kind of questions that they had, um, I think, you know, the things they were wrestling through, like, how do I feel about taking a vow of, of um, obedience to the queen along with my ordination vows? And I thought, <laughs> oh, right. So Anglicanism is started as an established church, um, you know, and, and as an American, you know, we feel separated from that. But, um, but, you know, how did this really get started? And how do I, how do I feel about Henry VIII and, and the, the break from Rome? Um, and, yeah, just, I mean, a lot of those kinds of questions right. that I started feeling actually a lot more unsettled right. um, about being an Anglican. And and I also, um, I haven't mentioned this, but but my about the time I started be, um, becoming Anglican, my brother actually, who had been Anglican, became Eastern Orthodox. And so that had always been a conversation partner about the early church and those kinds of things. So I actually did my, while in Cambridge, I did my one-year master's at the Institute for Orthodox Christian Studies because they began to feel like, well, maybe I should become Orthodox. Like, you know, I felt like I had this family connection, but also just that sense of like even deeper roots. Um, and, and so that was um, a whole, you know, a, a year of that kind of study, really digging into the yeah. patristics. Um, but along the way, there are other funny things too, because it was a consortium. So there were other other students of of other Christian stripes there as well. So I was in class with uh, with Catholics and Methodists and and Reformed. There were all these different theological houses that we all took classes together. Um, and I actually lived at the Roman Catholic Women's College for a, a term, my first term. So it was like me and all these nuns from Africa who were there <laughs> studying. Um, so just again, just continue to have these very positive interactions with Catholics. And, and unlike in high school where the people that I met, I felt like didn't really know what was going on, 
these are people that have really lively faith. Um, and that was that was winsome. So yeah. I still didn't feel like the Catholic Church had a had a call on me specifically, but I really grew to really respect it and and the people that I got to know. Um, so a year at the Orthodox Institute, I, I just felt I just never quite felt like I could really say yes. Yeah. Something was was holding me back mm -hmm. from from saying yes to that. Um, but a, a, again, a real gift. I mean, you know, if you think of how I love that sense of yeah. Christians throughout the world, it was it was a real honor to be um, invited into that community. Right. I was the only non-Orthodox person, which sometimes made it kind of awkward. Um, they weren't sure what to do with me, but I wasn't sure what to do with myself, really. Yeah. You know, I was still making sense of of where where God might be calling me and where I should really plug in right. um, for a church. So, but. So many gifts, particularly a love of the patristics and the early church. I wrote my dissertation on late fourth century virginity treatises. Um, and I'll say this inside because it was a silly, kind of a yeah. silly thing. But so it um, it became a pastoral resource. This is uh, my master's thing. So it's singleness and the early church just has all these things. But one of the editors of this, when he read the manuscript, wrote on it, this author may be more comfortable as a Roman Catholic. <laughs> because in here, you know, hold, I... Hold it up so they... Would, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. called Singleness in the Early Church. And sure. so, I, you know, as a single woman myself, I was trying to think, how, what is it like, what does it mean to live a, um, you know, an adult single life that's following Christ, that's not, that's not um, you know, dependent on whether I'm married or not. Right. And I felt like there was just so much encouragement in the early church yeah. and in um, in these writings in particular of right. what it means to center your life on Christ. And that's the thing. Right. There's, pro there's probably not much of a tradition of that, like in terms of your evangelical background. I mean, that, but no. you kind of look to the early church. That's mm -hmm. more of an established vocation. There was right. more of a theology for that, right? Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think okay. growing up, there would be more of a sense of like, you know, do you have the gift of singleness or whatever, you know, when you sure, take those okay. spiritual gift tests right, right. and uh, you're like, oh, well, I have the gift of mercy. I, I don't want the gift of, of <laughs> celibacy or whatever, you know, <laughs> there was sort of a joke about that. But, sure. but I, you know, I felt like, well, I, if I'm going to be single, yeah. I, I want to live it well. Yeah. And so this kind of material was just such an encouragement right, to me. Right. So, yeah. but I thought that was so funny. Yeah, you know, was... it was another little touch of like <laughs> right. people being like, mm, uh, you know, maybe there's another place for you. So all these things, you know, of course, they're memorable. Yeah. Um, and so after I felt like, you know, I just, for whatever reason, couldn't couldn't choose orthodoxy, um, I decided, you know, maybe it's time to reconsider the, the Catholic Church or look at it really more seriously. Right. And so um, for a while, I still said like, well, someday I'll, I'll probably either become Catholic or orthodox. Um, but there was a point where I felt like, no, I just don't feel like I can become Orthodox. So in 2015 is when I started my PhD and um, I was going to do it on, I mean, born to be king. Um, I moved to Scotland, so at the University of St. Andrews. And so the very first church I visited was St. James Catholic Church there because I felt like I'm in a new place. I had been really involved in ministry at my Anglican church in Minnesota. I mean, a really wonderful church. And it, it, it was really heartbreaking to kind of think of that. But moving to a new place gave me a kind of freedom um, to start fresh and ask some of those questions, which I had been kind of um, right. setting aside for a while because I had been involved. I'd been on staff. I had been on the vestry board and the parish council, <laughs> you know, and I remember even once saying to the, asking the priest saying, I, I think I should get off the vestry board because I, I really think I'm, I'm either going to become Catholic or Orthodox. And he said, well, you're going to have to explain it to the congregation. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> raising the stakes, you know? Yeah. And so, um, but anyway, a few, another, I think was only a year later is when I moved to St. Andrews for that. And so it felt like it was the right time to explore that. And then in 2016, I was uh, received into the church. Um, but I'm trying to think of that process. Yeah. I just, um, I don't know. There are just a lot of, of important I don't know, little touches. A lot of it had to do with um, people that I that yeah. I met whose whose faith I, I kind of recognized. I didn't mention this, but you know, just kind of leading up to those years right before going to St. Andrews, 
I was volunteering with a ministry at the University of Minnesota called Anselm House, and they partnered for a book group that I led on Augustine um, with St. Paul's Outreach. And, um, and so it ended up being only St. Paul's Outreach students that um, enrolled in my, in my group. So mm -hmm. for like a whole semester, every week, it was me and this group of like 10 St. Paul's Outreach students, um, which for those who don't know, it's, it's a, a wonderful, pretty charismatic Catholic yeah. um, group that works on college campuses. And so we had these wonderful conversations. We, so we're discussing patristics. We, we were looking at um, this volume that had all of his treatises on marriage and virginity. Mm. So it connected to the work I had been doing. Um, but I just, just through seeing how they interacted with each other, the things they talked about, I just felt like, wow, these people actually have a kind of warmth of faith that actually reminds me of the kind of evangelical warmth that mm -hmm. I grew up with. And so that was very attractive. Yeah. Um, the next year, um, at this point, I was trying to prepare myself for a PhD in patristics. So I, I took a year of, of ancient Greek at the University of St. Thomas, where I now work. But there I just, I went there for a year, but it was all me and minor seminarians from St. Mm. John Vianney Seminary yeah. um, in this class. And their witness was really important too how they interacted with each other, what they talked about. I mean, I was kind of like the odd older student in the class, you know, not necessarily involved in kind of the student -y conversation, but overhearing what they would talk about and what was important to them. I thought, okay, well, if I became Catholic, I could maybe be that kind of Catholic, you know? <laughs> right. um, so, so here I am now in, in St. Andrews. And, you know, I had some of the, the normal Protestant objections I had to you know, do some deep thinking about the Eucharist, about, you know, coming to understand um, adoration. I remember I had some important questions about that, about Our Lady. Um, but, but a lot of it was just feeling like there is a, a community of people that I'm coming into. Right. Um, I will say that one of the hardest things for me, but also the biggest blessings, was, was doing my first confession. Uh. Um, just the, you know, the week before I was received. I don't know why I was so terrified. And I think it connects back to just the way I was wired as a child. I really wanted to do things right, really wanted God's approval. I wanted, um, you know, just that, just that sense of, you know, confession had always been a kind of internal thing. Even in a liturgical setting, it had always been just, you know, a set prayer we were all saying together, but it was never specific. And so, I, I was really terrified. And I'll, this is one of my favorite stories because, yeah. um, you know, a, a priest brought in another priest. Is this like St. Andrews is only one parish in the whole town. And so, you know, there's one priest. And so he brought in another priest to hear our first confessions, which was generous of him. <laughs> and um, so, but I was the last of our RCIA group to go through. And I was terrified and I, you know, I had put in so much work. I had gone through all my old journals and my old things. And I was thinking, okay, I was baptized at 16. I have so much ground to cover. I was 40 at this time. So, okay, 24 years to cover. And, you know, and he's just saying, don't number in kind, number in kind, you know, to, to help you remember, uh, like, don't, you don't have to be, you know, you can think of themes or whatever. And that was very helpful. Yeah. But I had it all written out and everything. And I, you know, went in there and, but I was, you know, following this sheet, you know, and with fear and trembling. And it specifically said, you know, after the greeting, tell the priest your state of life. And then it said, bless me, Father, for I've sinned. And so then, <laughs> so he, you know, it just gives a, a you know, says, oh, I think the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then I said, Father, I'm a PhD student. And he interrupts me and says, Bless me, Father, for I, and I was like, oh, I'm sorry. I'm just following this sheet. And I was like, this is exactly what I was afraid of. You know, I thought it was, you know, I was like, this is the, the torment I was expecting. And then, and I said, I'm so sorry, Father. This is my first confession. And I, I'm just following exactly what it says here. And he says, oh, okay, <laughs> let's start over. And he was so gracious and understanding. But I, you know, it was like my greatest fear, but also the Lord relieving my fear sure. um, of that. And then I have never felt so light. Like really for the first couple of years, every time I go to confession, there was like a very palpable sense of sacramental grace 
um, from the Lord because it it really was it was hard for me. Um, but there was always that sense of like, but I have really forgiven you, and right. I felt so light after it. Um, so, you know, there's maybe people That's out wonderful. there who are yeah. terrified of that particular step. I was, but. It, you know, and if it if it hadn't been required, I wouldn't have done it right. for sure. Yeah. Um, but the Lord knew that's what I needed. That's what I needed for my own healing. Yeah, yeah. He designed us. Um, he knows our human nature, and it is amazing how the sacraments sort of they meet us both spiritually and physically. They meet us, you know, yeah. In, in terms of our whole humanity, God knows yes. how to how to care for us. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but it, it's, sure. sometimes this is tough, though. Too. Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> so. Um, Anyway, so, I mean, I guess yeah. Sayers played a little bit of a role in, in that time. I was, of course, working on these plays, which are Life of Christ plays. It's a series of 12 plays on the life of Christ. And so I, I felt like I spent those three years in St. Andrews just really, um, you know, spending my time in the four Gospels and getting to know them and creating, I created this cross-referencing um, system and so that I could track how she used each of the Gospels. Um, but she, I also had to get come to terms with her theology, which um, made me dig deeper into um, her theology as an, as an Anglo-Catholic. So she's an Anglican in this high church group called, that we call Anglo-Catholics. So I had to dig into like, what is, what would we say is, you know, what, what could I be expecting to see or, or, or wanting to compare it to? Right. Um, and so I ended up writing, um, an article, which ended up being a chapter of my dissertation as well, but it's called disambiguation Sayers as a Catholic, because she used the word Catholic with a big C for herself. And, um, this is a kind of a particular Anglo Catholic style of, of use of that word. Right. Um, and so I had to figure out what that was, but sometimes when I would read other things, which is why I called it disambiguation, cause I'd run into other scholars things and they'd be like, well, she never became Roman Catholic. So I don't really know what she means here. Um, and so I thought, okay, well, somebody should write an article about how to understand this. Um, so, but it really helped me. Like I, I read a bunch of Newman at that time too. And I felt like I came to really appreciate at least what, Anglo Catholicism was was trying to be, but also feeling like it just wasn't enough. Mm. And so it's not that it wasn't there weren't some good things about it gotcha. or, or beautiful, wanting to reconnect with the early church, wanting to see themselves in in this universal sense of, of Christians throughout time and place. Of course, these are themes that, yeah. as you know, uh, you know, were important to me. Um, but it just wasn't it wasn't enough. I needed more. So these things were kind of floating in my mind as I'm working on these plays. And I would say that the real turning point for me um, was sitting in on a lecture on the magisterium. Now, I didn't feel like the magisterium was, was my issue. You know, I would have said, oh, maybe the Virgin Mary might be my issue. Um, but sitting through this lecture and, and, and seeing like, wow, like, how oh, actually we need a magisterium mm. as an Anglican seeing like th there were some points within um, even my own parish church while we were becoming part of of my Anglican parish church when we were becoming part of the Anglican Church of North America and forming a new diocese in the upper Midwest. There were a lot of documents going around that that um, that people I remember people in the church were like, is that is is that actually Anglican theology? And I was like, actually, it's not. Like some like one of the people who wrote the document loved theology of the body, and so there was something in there about like you know um, not using artificial contraception. And so people reading that and being like, what? We have never talked about that at our church. Like, is that an Anglican thing? And being like, actually, it's not. It's actually a Catholic thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so why was it there? So it kind of felt like I've used the phrase um, like choose your own adventure Anglicanism. Yeah. And and that it was just, it felt like there was no way to kind of measure whether what we were doing was standard. Because within Anglicanism, it's the liturgy that holds everybody together. We're all using the same liturgy, the same Book of Common Prayer. But um, there wasn't, you could be like a really, you know, really liberal Anglican, a really conservative Anglican, a really traditional, really, you know, um, 
Reformed Anglican, uh, non-Reformed Anglican. Uh, GP2 Anglican, apparently, yeah. with the yeah. theology of the body. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, you know, it was kind of choose your own adventure, yeah. um, which some people didn't didn't mind. They maybe like that. But for me, it felt like there's just not enough ground under my feet. Mm. And um, and then in the summer of 2015, when, um, when the Supreme Court passed the, the gay marriage um, case, I, I just remember feeling like, the, the Catholic media that I was reading and beginning to read by this time, you know, I felt like they were they were putting it into context within this larger thing. Like this isn't a single issue, single ticket issue. You know, what marriage is is connected to what it means to be human and the purpose for the family and and uh, what sexuality is and what that, you know, what that gift is and how it connects to everything else. And I just found that really winsome. And I, I felt like, wow, I, I need that. Um, and and the speaker talking about how how Christ promised that he would have this, um, you know, the Holy Spirit would continue to, to teach and lead and through his apostles. And I guess I'd always thought that that I don't know that it's kind of gone away or something, <laughs> um, but really feeling convicted like, no, this is actually still here. And I can I can trust the magisterium of the Catholic Church. And I. I need it. I need it to give me the kind of support and structure I need for for my faith, and um, and so that actually, like that evening, I was like, yeah, no, I can become Catholic. I might still have other questions, right. but this one is actually kind of the key to all the others. Right. If I can trust the idea of a magisterium and that this is the true um, church, um, that these other questions will be answered in time and worked through. So. Right. Well, we've got about uh, seven minutes left, and so okay. I mean that that the important tur turning point there. But you yeah. did go on to enter the church. I did. Point. Okay. Yep. And uh, yeah, March of 2016, during the Year of Mercy, ah. that was really important to <laughs> yeah. me at the time, and our even our parish church because it was in St. Andrews, which had been historically been a very big city for pilgrimage mm. for the cult of St. Andrew. Um, it had a holy door, so I had this picture of myself beaming <laughs> on Easter morning, um, under you know, in our holy door, yeah. and um, that that was really special to me. Um, and yeah, the beginning of a of a new adventure. I, you know, as I said, I was in the middle of a PhD program at this time, so it actually had it had some ramifications for me. I had been teaching undergraduate theology before I left at actually at a Pentecostal school, mm. um, North Central University. Lovely people. I really enjoyed the, getting the opportunity to teach. I taught Christology and soteriology. Um, but it, it meant I probably wouldn't be able to go back there or I probably, you know, I was no longer a good candidate for a, a Protestant evangelical school, but I, I really wasn't a candidate yet for a while, at least for a Catholic school because I had never had to study Aquinas or all these things that I, I just felt like, I don't know why, you know, like this is maybe shooting myself in the foot, but I, I felt like it was the right thing to do. Um, and the Lord has provided. Um, I, I worked at a parish for a while in faith formation. Um, I had done that kind of work in an Anglican setting for a long time. So some transferable skills, but it was certainly a learning experience. Yeah. And, um, and then uh, now, here I am working at the Center for Catholic Studies at the University of, of uh, St. Thomas Very in cool. Minnesota, um, which has been a wonderful coming together of a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm a managing editor for a journal, so yeah, I'll that show one. that one Very off, cool. the Logos Journal, and I get to choose the, um, the artwork on the cover and write the art notes, which is my favorite Beautiful. part. Yeah. Um, of, I guess, my, my work of it. But I, I love, it's an interdisciplinary journal. So it's the Journal of Catholic Thought and Culture. Um, and it's, it's very faith and. Right. So uh, obviously Catholic faith is at the center of everything that's in here. But there's all these different articles that relate to psychology or political science or, um, you know, literature or um, music or... Um, visual art, it's just, it's like at the center of all these different things. So it's yeah. right in my wheelhouse with what I have studied before. I mean, it's maybe even a, like a, a better application of my, of my, of my training yeah. than, than I might've even chosen for myself. So it, um, or have 
forecasted for myself, I yeah. guess. I guess I did choose to apply well, for the job. It was a, but, you know, I was thinking the, the theme kind of throughout your life. I mean, the, uh, one, there, there are different ways to think in terms of the word Catholic, but yeah. one, one sense of it, I think, is I think the church forms us in our ability to uh, have this universal appreciation for truth, goodness, and beauty wherever it's yes. found. And so yes. there is this ability to embrace you know, wherever you find it. And so mm -hmm. throughout your life, you sort of had that sense. You had a very Catholic yeah. instinct in that yeah. sense of, of, of recognizing and embracing the true, the good, and the beautiful mm -hmm. in all these different contexts and people. Yeah. So that's, that's wonderful. It seems like a great project. It is. Yeah. And I, I feel like it's continuing my education. I yeah. learned, you know, now I, I'm actually getting a lot more Aquinas these days <laughs> than um, than I ever have before. Right. And, um, you know, it, each each issue is like a like a whole class that Wonderful. I'm taking. Yeah. So I really enjoy that. Awesome. And that's, um, what's the web, website for, if they want to find more about the Logos? Yes. So yeah. um, it would be uh, www.stthomas.edu slash Logos. Good. Okay. Very good. Yep. I had to think about that yeah, one yeah, for yeah. a second. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's a wonderful journal. It's a quarterly journal. Okay. Um, so it is, you know, there's scholarly articles, but we, we really want to place ourselves, you know, um, with these things. We have a lot of, of lay readers, we have a lot of, um, you know, priests and religious that, that subscribe to it as well. So Good. It, broadly Catholic. Yeah. And, and then, so, and then, and this project finally has yes. come to culmination oh, recently. At the end of eight years. <laughs> yeah. It's such a pleasure. So I started this research January, 2015, and now, you know, January, 2023, the book comes out from IVP Academic. And um, so it's just really satisfying. Yeah. Um, so, you know, of course my dissertations, chapters on different things, how she used scripture, how she used external sources, what her theology is. But, you know, who wants to read that kind of a book <laughs> when you could read the actual plays, but have all that information um, that, you know, all the best bits from all my other research is, is in here now, tucked right next to the lines that I am discussing. Very so, cool. um, you know, with a with a Bible background, I always wanted to know when I read these the first time, now which gospel yeah. is that story from? And so now you don't have to wonder. They're right there at the footnotes for you. Um, and sometimes, you know, I even track when she uses different details from different gospels because she definitely has them open in front of her as she's sure. writing. You know, this is mainly from Luke, but she borrows details from Mark for this story, that kind of thing. So that's all there for you. And then down the sides um, are excerpts from her letters where she explains different, um, you know, why she's doing certain things, her back and forth with, with the head of religious broadcasting at the BBC. Mm -hmm. So these, I mean, did I say this? These originally, um, you know, radio plays on the BBC during World War II. Wow. So they had a real... Um, a real service to people, really. Helping. I mean, the BBC did so much, um, you know, specific religious broadcast right. at that time. Yeah. They don't do too much these days. Yeah. Um, but then they were doing church services and and um, extra sermons from, and they were they were trying to be ecumenical. You know, they would have um, clergy from different um, traditions. Um, but these plays were a really important thing for them. There was a big controversy because, I should say, like today with with um, the chosen, these right. are kind of like the the chosen of the 1940s. Yeah. There were people who uh, who didn't care for them, but some people who really didn't like them. So right. there was a big protest movement and letters written to the BBC to try and stop them, um, because people felt like it was irreverent for Jesus to be a character. Yeah, um, that is something. I mean, there's a bigger story there about um, theater in the UK and how actually a member of the Trinity was not allowed to be portrayed on stage from the time of the Reformation up until the early um, early 1900s um, because of blasphemy one. laws. Yeah, so there's that yeah. kind of thing going on. So some people, it's still, you know, that sentiment was still there, sure. that it's not appropriate for someone to impersonate Christ. And so um, she knew that was going to be controversial, um, but the BBC was game. And I think once people actually heard the plays, mm -hmm. they they really loved them and they were rebroadcast and rebroadcast and the, the plays were reprinted and, you know, went through so many different editions. And now we have this annotated edition to yeah. give people the, all the, sort of like the backstage tour sure. of the plays while you're reading them. Beautiful. So just chock full. And these are studied in classical education these days quite mm -hmm. a bit um, and in homeschooling. So, I mean, how fun, this would be a great kind of teacher's edition. Yeah. Um, but also, 
I mean, I could imagine, you know, I mean, I when I present on them, sometimes I, I pass out scripts and we, we read a scene aloud. It just brings it to life and people really love that. And I can yeah. see it in a class setting or within a family. You know, what a wonderful gift. That's It'd wonderful. be so fun to yeah, read. Yeah, I'm looking forward to reading those. it myself and yeah. with my, my family. So very cool. Well, Katie, thank you so much for joining us tonight yes. and for sharing your story and your work. Uh-huh. Uh, very, as I said, I'm very <laughs> looking forward to digging into that myself. But thank you Good. for sharing. Yes, you're awesome. welcome. My pleasure. Awesome. And thank you for joining us for this episode of the Journey Home program. I pray that Dr. Catherine Weir's story was an inspiration to you. And again, you can check out her, her resources, her book, uh, CatherineWare.com. We'll have that, that website up there. Uh, but we'll be back again next week with another story. In the meantime, we'd love to hear from you. Go to chnetwork.org, send us a message. We'd love to hear about your story, your journey. Keep praying for us. We'll be praying for you as you take the next step in your journey with Jesus Christ. God bless you. See you again next week.